Hi everyone in Cloud Computing and welcome to episode 62 of the Cloud Computing Australia show, featured on YouTube and podcasts with Brad Nelson and internationally recognised and the world's number one cloud industry expert and thought leader, David Linthicum. This show is sponsored by Nelson Hilliard, Cloud Computing Recruitment Specialist, placing great people in cloud, IoT, fintech and AI. This week we are excited to have Dr. Kirk Bourne as our special guest. Kirk is the Principal Data Scientist and Executive Advisor at management consultancy firm Booz Allen Hamilton. Previously, Kirk was Professor of Astrophysics and Computational Science at George Mason University. Kirk has spent nearly 20 years supporting data systems activities for NASA space science missions, and since 2013, he has been listed consistently each year as a top worldwide influencer in big data and data science on social media. Hi, Kirk. It's great to have you on the Australia Show this week, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Brad. I'm so glad to be here. That's quite a mouthful introduction. I guess if I was Paul McCartney or Judy Durham, I wouldn't need such an introduction. It's a great introduction. Look, it's taken a couple of takes, but I'll make sure I edit it down so it just sounds so smooth. Uh, Dave, again, great to have you on the Australia show this week. Thanks for being a part of it. Yeah, it's great yeah, to be really. here. So, yeah, it's also he's very close uh, in the Washington, D.C. area. So, Kirk, did you get your job by standing uh, on the side of the highway holding a sign that says, I want to work for booze? <laughs> That's, uh, sometimes I'm asked that question, and the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, excellent. I love it. So, look, in this week's show, chaps, and, and look, we really do appreciate your, your time today. I know it's, it's taken a while to, to get all three of us together, so uh, I, I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the show as well, so it's, it's going to be cool. So, look, in this week's show, we're talking about that artificial intelligence is reshaping the future of the financial services industry. And look, will AI transform the realities of financial institutions by radically changing front and back office operations, creating major shifts in structure and regulation for the financial services? So I guess the opening questions then for you coming to you first, Dave, is how do you see artificial intelligence upending the competitive dynamics for the Australian financial services ecosystem? Yeah, it's really having a big effect on our financial clients, um, people I'm working with. You know, ultimately, we're you know leveraging uh, very tactical uses of uh, of AI, machine learning based systems to you know do fraud detection, to do uh, you know stock picking, to do you know things that are typically you know going to be left to the um, you know MBAs and uh, and uber smart people who are in essence kind of I think going to be displaced by. A lot of these AI based systems. And the reality is that if you're able to embrace it and leverage it effectively as kind of a force multiplier for your business, it's going to have a good effect. If you kind of overestimate and over replace things, it's going to have a uh, uh, dramatically poor effect as we're finding as we're moving forward. So I think that this is really going to be for those organizations that are able to take risks, invest in technology you know, spend more than 1% on IT uh, and get to a level where they're leveraging AI and other technologies as a force multiplier. Your ability to kind of build these things in directions are going to you know, allow you to, you know, take your business to the next level and, and kind of create a space that doesn't exist anymore. And so Australia, I think, is on the brink of doing that because the number of banks that are there, uh, the amount of money that they're spending on technology is typically in excess of what we're seeing in the United States and in Europe. Uh, so I think it's going to be very interesting to watch the market. So what do you think, Kirk? Yeah, absolutely. I agree with those statements. Uh, I'm just re refreshing my memory. I, I have made one trip to Australia in my life, and I was actually uh, doing some consulting with uh, various clients there of a company that hired me to come talk to um, some of their clients. And uh, some of the banks in Australia were, were folks that I talked with, and it was, it was very clear that even then, this was like six years ago, there was great interest in uh, getting more out of the data, more more sort of pattern discovery, and and therefore, you know, more efficient and effective operations. And so the things that you mentioned, Dave, are very much sort of top of mind in the financial market, right? If there, there's the sort of the fraud issue of, of uh, detection, you know, through patterns and data, but also understanding customer desires and intentions, a customer experience uh, aspect of AI, which is also automating. Uh, how you interact with the customer, what offers you make to a customer, what products are best suited to a customer. Uh, you're basically finding those patterns and trends in the data that uh, it make all those things more efficient and more effective. And so that force multiplier really is the key. And I really like what you said about getting out too far ahead, so to speak, going too far out on the limb, 
with this stuff because uh, if, you get, if you take too big of a step, you're going to you know may, maybe not uh, you, over, you overshoot basically and not really find the uh, success as you would if you take uh, smaller steps. So we often talk about that minimal viable product, and I think you know you know moving along that path uh, cautiously but but still effectively is, is is where people are going now. So where do you see the banking industry like in 10 years with the use of AI and other technologies? Do you think that this is going to be a a make or break opportunity for lots of the bigger banks, Um, you know, um, marrying this with technologies like blockchain and other kind of tactical transactional things that we see in the space and, you know, some of the increased regulations that are going on? Is is this going to be a system where banks are just basically big computers with a few people around who maintain them? Well, I think we're still going to have the human in the loop. Uh, I think most organizations don't want to get rid of that uh, ex- human expertise. But I think you're right. There's uh, sort of a similarity to something I heard a few years ago uh, when we were at the. I was at the university, and we were reaching out to local corporations, fairly large corporations, who had their international offices in the Washington D.C. area, to see if we could get some internships. And uh, for example, one of these companies was a major hotel chain. Uh, they have hotel properties all across the world. And when we talked with them, they said, we no longer call ourselves a hotel company. We call ourselves a big data company who owns property. And so I think we're sort of going to see the same thing. The companies are going to say, we are basically an AI company who happens to do banking. All right, so so they so that they're using the AI again to sort of navigate all that information, both from the customer side, uh, from the market side, from the financial uh, portfolio side, all, all these different ways of dealing with massive information flood in the in the world we live in today. And what makes it really different from the past is the personalization angle, I always think. Uh, in the past, it, you know, one size fits all, right? You, you used to you have a savings account and you have a checking account, and that was pretty much it when you went to the bank. And now there's going to be t- you know, choices tailored to the individual. Do you think the regulations are going to be able to keep up with the technology? Or is this like we're uh, doing now? The regulations are typically three to five years behind. And so while we're, we're building these, you know, force multipliers, these disruptors, you know, in the banking industry and all other industries as well, they're all going to basically be impacted by this. Finding that the regulators are in essence uh, a few steps behind and therefore having trouble trying to keep up with the changes in order to regulate them. And thinking of the banking industry, it's it's moving so fast right now and the regulation regulators are moving so slow. Besides some rudimentary things they're putting as follow-up stuff that, you know, we have to deal with like uh, GDPR, you know, things like that. What do you think they, uh, those guys are going to do in the next 10 years? Well, I think uh, you're right. There's a, there's a um, sort of an out of the sink issue going on here. But I think uh, the banks and, and financial institutions that are ahead of the curve are going to you know, find themselves uh, in a favorable position if they start using uh, those, this AI and machine learning and uh, sort of data analytics capability uh, in, uh, sort of proactively. That is, you're actually using these tools to to prove compliance, uh, you know, with GDPR and other app, uh, regulations that already exist. Uh, so, uh, using things like blockchain uh, to secure transactions and maybe even enable uh, things that we never saw in the past, which maybe have sort of much more fluid transfers of funds between institutions, because a lot of people now have money in multiple places. And sort of the same way you can share your electronic health record through a secure blockchain. From from you know one provider to the next. Uh, imagine doing the same thing with our financial data, and so uh, institutions who can sort of get ahead of this curve and start doing these things. So when the regulators catch up and find, hey, you're already doing this stuff, or maybe some particular bank could be the model that the regulators use. And so that's a, a big win opportunity for an organization that doesn't just run out in front of everybody with the services and products, but but also gets out in front in terms of. Uh, sort of self-regulation, so to speak. So looking at the privacy issues, I think that, um, you know, we're going to be, you know, dealing with some of that because information is kind of funny. We can have absolute information that exists in databases that we can look at. And some of that may be personal information, some of that maybe not. But we can almost take anonymized information and find patterns in it and actually arrange those patterns around human beings and are likely human beings in these, uh, you know, big data scenarios. And so um, this is kind of getting big brotherish, but, you know, at the end of the day, these banks are going to hold the key to pretty much everything what we're all about, our spending habits and where we spend and where we live and, 
how much we make, and and they don't even really need to get the payroll information, and the uh, they just need to get an anecdotal data about me or you or other people, and it's able to make assertions, um, you know, based on the anecdotal da- anecdotal data like you've seen. Are we going to end up having to, you know, put regulations forward so we're limiting that, and so if people are getting at PII information as an abstraction of data, that that is an, indeed still something that's regulated. Yeah, I think that's part of the. Uh, I think the benefit of blockchain is is that if if you're using those data and patterns to deliver better services, personalized services, uh, that can be done in, in a way that where you're not actually seeing the data of the customer, right? So if I, if a bank wants to recommend a product or a service or a particular investment to an, to someone, they can do that in a way without actually looking at the person's data, but they need access to the data to do that personalization. So. So as long as the data are secure, even from the algorithm, but still explainable, okay, to, explainable, how did it come to this conclusion? Uh, th- then I think the Big Brother issue sort of gets minimized a bit because it's not like someone sitting around looking at your data to learn about you personally, <laughs> but but an algorithm is looking at your data to say, gee, maybe you would like this particular type of investment product, or maybe uh, this person who is imitating you is actually a fraudster who's trying to hack into your account, but but the behavior pattern of this particular person as they're, as they're uh, uh, browsing your account is different from how you would browse your account. And so that behavior pattern is an indicator of fraud. So, so all this information is being fed to an algorithm, maybe in a way that's, again, uh, still secure, still private, uh, but it delivers an actionable piece of information that, that someone can then take an action on it. I'm not necessarily saying a robot will take the action, though sometimes that can happen. Certainly on a, rec- a product recommendation, it's okay that a robot recommends a book to me because if I decide not to buy it, it's not harming anybody. Uh, but you know, I, I think the algorithm doesn't need to know about, uh, needs to know the data, but the individual person who's taking the action at the end of the chain doesn't need to know the personal information. Do, do we see the, uh, uh, the banks uh, who are really, really good at AI, as you mentioned, they're, a, they're an AI company that also does banking, you know, versus a banking company that may or may not do AI, and they end up trouncing them in the market. And so they become not only a disruptor, but someone that displaces some major brands, including brands that are in Australia. Uh, do we see a lot of that happening in the next 10 years, or do you think the banks are going to be smart and start adopting the technology and leveraging it correctly? Well, I think there's a, a lot of fear in that, in that financial world. When you look at the fintech uh, community that the startups are around financial services and financial products. Uh, I mean, I'm not a real expert in uh, how disruptive they're going to be, but it's certainly a very disruptive uh, scenario is developing where, where a lot of small players are able to deliver, you know, for example, information about loans, information about investments, uh, and you don't need to go to the big player anymore to, to, to get that kind of assistance. And you know, sometimes even it's like an aggregation site. Okay? People say we're living in the platform era, right? So, so there's a lot of large companies. We can name them like rideshare companies and, and, and you know, bedroom share companies. I won't name their names, but we know who they are. Uh, those companies don't actually own anything, right, except the platform on which other people are part of their services. And so I can imagine that some fintechs are going to step in there and sort of barter services between major banks, and they're going to be sort of the, the go-to sort of a bank teller, if you will. So so I think there's disruption definitely going to happen. I'm not sure it's going to necessarily remove the existence of a large bank because there's a stability there and certainly there's the, the regulatory side of that. But in terms of uh, front-end services, I mean, imagine there's going to be quite a bit, big change. So, um, Brad, you actually live in Australia. So uh, are people uh, <laughs> around concerned about AI? I just want to thank you guys because the content's been great this week. I've thoroughly enjoyed listening to you both um, go back and forth talking about this topic. So look, I think the general consensus, it can be very convenient to, to not have to sort of forward think too much when it comes to technology and it's sort of almost second guessing your next move. But I think equally there is a, a, an element of vulnerability on you know what access is available to the personal information. How is it going to be used? Is it going to be used for the good of the cause or is there an ulterior motive as to why this information is being collected? Is the information actually relevant to the service that you know one needs to use? And sometimes there's often that um, blockage where you can't actually use the service unless you've given 
you know, what seems to be unnecessarily a, a high amount of personal information uh, just to access a website or something like that. So I think, look, I think it's a, it swings and roundabouts. I think the education is definitely there and it's filtering through. Uh, and I think people are embracing it. And certainly organisations are embracing it, as, as you guys have, have, have quite well put today. Um, but I think there is apprehension. There is definitely apprehension there as how far, where's that line that you draw between the human response and the human interaction between a bot behind the scenes that's you know scraping the relevant data to position you for the next sale or the next you know I don't know um, Google ad campaign that's going to be telling your browser everything you should be buying next because you've you've looked at X and now you need to buy Y or Z or whatever it is and sort of you know building that cohesion I think is you know I think that um, that can disturb people <laughs> um, especially uh, you know if if you're if you're finding things that you, you never really wanted to find and they're just being put in front of you all the time. Um, I, I've had a couple of friends that have, have had things happen to them like that and they're like, well, um, it's just bizarre what's going on, Brad. I said, look, I deal with cloud, okay? It's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> like, and I, sure. I, <laughs> but this happens in the cloud, obviously. Yes. But, um, but it's, very, it's very quite funny. So, I mean, look, essentially, um, without getting off topic, I think it's, it's being embraced, but I think there's a fine line between that, that human element and that robotic element that, that people still want to feel that they're in control of their personal data. It's not being compromised and it's being good, used for the good of the cause. I think that's uh, where, I, where I sit on that one. Uh, do you have any final thoughts at all there, Kurt? Well, I, I was just thinking about this uh, when I was very young, which was a long time ago. <laughs> Uh, I had a bank account, and uh, literally, I had to. When, whenever I had to make a deposit or withdrawal from this bank, I had to show up in person, and I had what was called a passbook. Okay, so a little book where they actually wrote down your deposits and withdrawals on in the book, and so right there in front of the teller, uh, she or he could actually see my entire balance and history of money I was taking in and out of the bank, and it's like that. That was a lot more personal data exposure than I think exists today. I mean, they, they could see when I was putting in maybe large deposits or taking out large withdrawals. And I sort of vaguely remember someone even asking me about that once, like, why are you taking this money out? Like, why is it their business, right? And so I, I think uh, th there was a degree of uh, sort of knowing your customer then that maybe is parallel to today where we didn't so much worry about it back in those days. And, I, and I, don't, I don't think we necessarily need to worry as much, again, because I think a lot of the algorithmic uh, consumption of data is uh, is going to be different than the, the human consumption of your data. So I don't think there's going to be as many, I don't believe there's going to be as many instances where, where some person is going to know your data as, as some algorithm is going to know your data. Yeah, it's true. You're, you're actually right. There was that sort of... Um transparency back in the day where, where people got kind of believe that's just the way things were. I think with the way technology's crept up, I think there's a, a, a skepticism sometimes or a cynicism around, you know, the paranoia of data collection, especially with all the, the Facebook stuff that was going on. <laughs> that makes sense. I understand. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Kirk. I appreciate that. And, and Dave, do you have your top three tips for this week by any chance? Yeah, I, I think number one is... Um is consider the value of the technology, you know, and not necessarily how it's going to transform you. And I think that uh, a lot of businesses have a tendency to freak out about jobs and transformation and org changes and things like that versus the value this stuff can bring. Um, typically, there's an increase in jobs if there's an increase in revenue, which means it's driven by an increase in use of technology. So typically, it's going to be the right way to go. And if you're not embracing technology, you're typically going to find that failure is going to be at the end of that rainbow. And that's going to become reduced jobs and reduced uh, opportunities within the organization. So don't get paranoid by that. The other thing is people's mileage may vary. I see that um, companies out there are um, struggling with AI uh, to a great degree. They're overusing it. They're misapplying it. They're, and, and it's cheap with cloud. You can buy it for you know, pennies on the dollar, what we had to pay for just 10 years ago. And they're using it in odd ways that, that mis, are misapplied. They're using things where procedural language would be fine and you know, any kind of programming paradigm would be fine. And, and you gotta watch that because they're gonna spend a million dollars when you can spend $100,000 to the same sort of application. And then finally, I, I think data really kind of leads the day. Your ability to kind of get data aligned with any kind of AI. Um, I always say the food and the, and the vitamins for AI is going to be the data ingestion you're able to do, whether it's IoT or edge computing or 
um, transactional systems or, you know, even, um, you know, data we're generating by clicking things on a browser. And your ability to manage that is probably fundamental and more fundamental to your ability to get kind of a mileage per gallon out of AI. And I think that people kind of overlook that. Their data ends up being a mess. They try to build AI systems on top of it. And it doesn't work any, anywhere near as well as a good data a good data uh, architecture that sits below an AI system. Yeah, great top tips there, Dave. Thank you so much. And I think that brings us to the close for the Australia show this week. So, Kirk, thank you so much for being part of the Australia show. It's been a, an absolute pleasure having you on and looking forward to the C-Suite show and the training show coming up. Well, great. Thanks again. That's awesome. And, and Dave, thanks again for your top tips and, and thanks again for being part of the Australia show. Yeah, it's good to talk about it. I mean, go, go, out and go Australia, especially with the AI stuff, leading the way. Go Australia. Yeah, there's a huge amount of fintech startups over here as well that we didn't even touch on, uh, to be honest. So there's a huge amount of disruption heading the way to the financial services, that's for sure. And look, thanks, guys, and thanks again for your content. It's been awesome. Uh, you can get everyone on Twitter, so I'll put all the links below, but you can get Kirk on Twitter, which is uh, at Kirk D. Bourne. Dave is on Twitter, which is at David Limpigan. I'm on Twitter, obviously, at Nelson underscore Heliard. As I said, all the links for all the social media are below in the description box, along with the blogs as well, so check those out. Thanks for watching, and remember to like, subscribe, comment, and share these videos with your friends and with your colleagues. Really important that we get your support, and we love your support, so thanks for all of that. Um, it's great. Um, Kirk's going to get this all over Twitter as well, which we're really excited about. So it's been a great show, and really looking forward to the C-Suite show and the training show coming up. So thanks for watching, and until next week.